Welcome to Kinship Cafe. I am your host, Jim Jones, and today we're going to take a look at evolution. We want to understand it at more of an introductory level today, kind of the big picture so we can see how all the pieces fit together, because as we're going to see later on, understanding the basics of evolution is key to how we're going to go about achieving a sense of well-being, which is a key issue for us here at Kinship Cafe. And one of the things that's crucial for actually achieving that well-being is that we are developing more of a coherence between our beliefs about the world, how we think about the world, and how the world actually is. And the more we can live in harmony with reality, uh, the more effective that we're going to be at achieving those goals. And, you know, working against reality is really pointless. It's not going to get you anywhere. So we really want to try and understand as much as possible about what our world is and how it works. And um, evolution is really key to understanding that in the big picture of things. Starting off, though, I do want to mention one thing about theory, why evolution is called a theory. Scientists use that word very differently than other people do. I know that when I was, you know, at at different times in my life, part of a church that, that rejected evolution because they thought it was a problem for how their theology worked, how they understood the Bible, they would constantly make the comment, well, evolution is just a theory, it's not proven, and therefore it's you know subject to debate, and they had competing theories. But that's not how scientists are using the term. What, what, what they were thinking is more in terms of like a hypothesis. A hypothesis is an idea that you come up with. It's maybe an initial run at trying to come up with how does... How do we explain certain phenomena? So there's there's phenomena that we might call facts, things that we see, that we observe, that we can touch. Um, and then there is how do we explain how they come about or what was the process by which they happened or tie together or related. And that's where initially we might start with a uh, hypothesis. But then as that hypothesis is tested and as it stands up to rigorous testing and pure review and other people being able to duplicate it, having testable predictions, then it moves into this category of theory. And theory really in this case is much more of uh, something that actually is, I mean, is our best working knowledge of something, kind of like gravity is called a theory. But we don't really have any question about whether or not gravity exists. Um, In the same way, evolution, there's no question that it exists, but it's always subject to revision as new information comes in about how the process works. And so we really want to keep that in mind, that yes, it's a theory, and that doesn't mean that it's just an idea or that it's not based on anything. There's actually a tremendous amount of evidence, and as we're going to see from every aspect of uh, you know, the scientific disciplines, evolution has become more and more of a central theme and essential for understanding pretty much everything. So we want to get past this idea of it being kind of at this untested, unsure level. It's really well established established and adopted by pretty much everybody. Mostly the people who wrestle with it are people that have more of an ideological problem, whether because they think it has a problem theologically or some other issue that that doesn't fit well for them. So what I want to do is try and understand what this big picture is and how it all fits together. So let's roll with that and we'll see where we go. I don't normally read quotes on here, but today I wanted to because I find this to be a very effective quote at pulling together lots of ideas and it gives us a good launching point to talk about several things. So grab my glasses so I can read this. And this is from Loyal Rue in a book that he wrote called Everybody's Story. And it says, 50 years ago, the only science to speak seriously about evolution was biology. But today, the paradigm of evolution is rapidly becoming the organizing principle for all the sciences. The physical sciences, the life sciences, the social sciences. The unifying insight behind this integration of the sciences is that the entire universe 
is evolving. The universe is a single reality, one long, sweeping, spectacular process of interconnected events. Wow. This is what we want to talk about because it's everything. Everything ties into it. Let's break it down a little bit. There's a couple of key words that he says in here, brings in, in particular, three different sciences that he mentions. The physical sciences, and the life sciences, and the social sciences. Now, if we kind of take these in order, they kind of match what we're going to see with evolution as well, because evolution is really kind of, you could break it down almost into three main types or 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 phases, let's say. Uh, the first one being more of what's referred to as chemical evolution. And this is going to relate to when he talks about physical sciences. And really one of the core aspects of this uh, part of chemical evolution is, is the atom. And we'll come back to that. The life sciences, then, is when we move into this idea of biological evolution. And these, you know, go in order. There's the physical science or the, let's say the chemical evolution first and then there's the biological evolution and the key thing that we're looking at here in terms of the mechanism that's happening is with genes and then there is this social science uh, sciences that's bringing in this idea that's more about cultural evolution and the key item here that we're going to be tracking is this idea of memes it's kind of like the equivalent to genes but in the ideological sphere. I know this gets used a lot in social media today to talk about, you know, a trending picture or a post, but really a meme in its original sense had to do with ideas that caught on and transformed and evolved whole cultures in the similar way that genes have the ability to transform populations. So those are some of the main areas, and we'll step through each of these one at a time. But then another sentence that I really want to touch on is when he says, the universe is a single reality, one long, sweeping, spectacular process of interconnected events. Wow. Now, when we're thinking at a certain level of granularity, let's say at the atomic level, physics level, we understand that the, the universe is knowable, that it is predictable, it operates according to principles and rules that we observe in nature, and because of that, we can have a good idea of how things happen, how they progress. In fact, at that level, if you wanted to know what was going to happen next, one of the ways you could answer that question is by saying, if you know the state of the universe, and by this we mean where every atom, every particle in the entire universe is at a particular moment, then based off of what we know from the laws of physics, we know what the very next moment would be. So in a certain sense, we can know going forward and going backwards how things happen, but to try and understand it at the level of the universe is not really practical because there's no way to know the state of the entire universe at any one given time, at least not by us or any of the devices that we have. You may need a computer the size of the universe if you really want to be able to track all that information, and of course, then we're back at square one. So even though in a certain sense, the, the physics, the laws of nature, the way chemistry functions dictates kind of how things unfold, it's at a level of complexity that's so far beyond our understanding, there's still this unknowable aspect of it for us. You know, to take it down to something much smaller, even just thinking about our weather we know how a lot of these things operate and we can create models and we can do predictions, but those predictions are only good for, you know, so far, right? And then eventually the little things that we didn't have or that we didn't know start to make big changes and our weather predictions are only good sometimes for hours, sometimes maybe for a couple of days, but certainly not for a whole year or something like that. So even though at the level of, let's say, particle physics, we can say that the everything is essentially kind of 
not destined, but operates according to certain principles that are predictable that we can know what would happen next. We don't know what's going to happen next in the big picture of things. And so there is still this kind of openness. And I, I kind of dive into this a little bit because one of the concerns people get into when we start looking at the world from this perspective is, well, what does that mean about free will? Is everything already laid out? Is there any chance for things to change? And nothing has to do with, you know, you not actually being able to make decisions or the future being open in some sense. It's it's at a different level of trying to understand things, right? It's like if we're trying to talk about who a person is, we could talk about Jim Jones as all the atoms in his body in their current state at a particular moment in time, but that's not really helpful at the level that we're trying to understand things. So at the level of our conversation, of our thinking about the level of people, um, talking about persons makes a lot more sense. So I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that, that this underlying complexity that can that can seem kind of scary sometimes doesn't necessarily have the impact at the everyday level that we operate at, but it's still important to understand and know how these things function. Because ultimately, again, our coherence with reality, how well we understand what's going on in the world, is going to be the number one thing that we have to work with in terms of about bringing about well-being, about having you know a way of understanding who we are in this world, how we should operate, how we affect change, this is going to be crucial that we understand the nature of the world that we live in. So with that in mind, let's then look at that first part, that physical sciences, where we're talking about chemical evolution and atoms, and how does this function? Um, again, we're not going to go super deep here, but I want to create this broad strokes, these sweeping images of how things develop so that you can understand how this fits together. So if we go back to the beginning, the Big Bang, 13.82 uh, billion years ago is when, as far back as we can go, there's nothing in the universe we're aware of that's older than that. So we know that this is kind of that time frame. At that point, there's essentially the entirety of the universe, which is extremely small, everything compacted to the size, maybe even smaller than an atom, uh, grows very quickly. They call this inflation. Uh, but at that initial stage, everything is just plasma. This energy is just everything is energy. And as it's rapidly expanding, things start to cool off a little bit. And as they do, there's kind of this differentiation that happens within that energy. You start to have certain particles that come in and out of existence as far as this energy and you want to remember like with Einstein who gave us the formula E equals MC squared what he's saying is that energy is equal to mass times twice the speed of light so you've got a tremendous amount of energy that's actually stored in matter you might think of matter as energy at rest Okay, and this is why things like, you know, nuclear bombs are so powerful because it just takes, you know, splitting apart a little bit of that matter that releases tremendous amounts of energy. But energy and matter are kind of the same thing. They go together. That's that E equals MC square. So these particles, this beginning of differentiation of matter is starting to kind of appear and, and go back into this plasma at this early stage until things start to really cool off. And we're actually talking about roughly 380,000 years from the Big Bang till we get to the point where there's enough stabilization with these particles that they're actually present and that they are able to um, come together in such a way that they form the first atoms, which is mostly hydrogen. Now, the thing that's pulling these together is there's, at the same time that we've got these particles that are developing, there's also four fundamental forces that we know of. 
Um, one of them is uh, electromagnetism, which we're very familiar with in terms of thinking about magnets, but it's also what's behind heat. It's also what's behind light. Um, but there's also the strong and weak nuclear forces, and these operate at a very small distance, and these are the things that actually hold atoms together. So if we think about like the, the nucleus of an atom where you've got a proton, neutron, the basic basic atom that you can have, hydrogen, has one proton in the nucleus and one electron. So to get to higher, or not let's say higher, but more advanced elements where you've got atoms that are made up of different amounts of protons in the center, you have to get them to come together. Now protons have a positive force. So as you know with magnets, you can't put two of the positive sides together. It requires a great deal of energy to get two protons close enough together that that strong nuclear force, which operates at a very small distance, can actually take hold and then bind them together. I'm jumping ahead just a little bit, but there's only basically 17 particles and four forces that explain everything that comes out of this early stage. This is what physicists would call the standard model. And so the four forces are the strong and weak nuclear force that operate at the atomic level, electromagnetism, uh, which is, you know, again, light, heat, and also that magnetic function that we see, and then, of course, gravity, which we're familiar with. And then these particles come together and make up the different elements of atoms as well as a few other things like photons that are what we think of as light. So 380 years after the Big Bang, the plasma has differentiated itself enough that it can come together to form stable particles that then actually kind of all together, all at once it seems like, snap together into these initial atoms, hydrogen, um, that then release these photons that were kind of stuck in this plasma to go out where there's suddenly this great light where all this happened, and there's kind of like this big phase transition. And this we still see today if you have an old TV that uses an antenna or, you know, we can listen to it with telescopes. We call it the cosmic microwave background radiation. And it's the leftover of this light that's, that was just released at this time when, when it all snapped together into these initial hydrogen, mostly hydrogen, atoms. So then we're in a situation where the universe has got these clouds of these atoms, these hydrogen atoms out there, but they're distributed unevenly. And this unevenness plus the force of gravity and time is going to equal stars. So what happens is these atoms, these hydrogen atoms, uh, when we think about gravity, we're talking about something with mass exerts a certain amount of force on other masses out there, right? So imagine that there's a couple of hydrogen atoms that are nearer each other than others. They get pulled together because of this gravity, but then their mass combined is a little bit more, and so it exerts a little bit more of a pull on some of these other atoms, and they start to come together into more of these dense clouds all over the universe that as they get closer and closer together, the gravitational force that starts to act on all these atoms as they're coming together is just, it threatens to squish them all back down into this little ball, and we start to to heat up in the center of it until the point of fusion happens, which is kind of almost going back to this point of plasma at the early universe. And, and that fusion that starts to happen pushes back out against the gravitational pull and it stabilizes. So you've got this ball of fire, basically, that we think of as suns or stars. And so in this star then, in that immense heat and that pressure inside of it, it's actually able to create new atoms, or not new atoms, it's combining atoms to form new elements. So where hydrogen has one proton, now we're starting to form helium, which has two protons. And so you've got this process where these stars, just because of that force of gravity and the fact that they're out there and enough pressure to get these atoms next to each other start to connect in a way that they then become 
through that strong nuclear force connected into a new element, and you've got now greater complexity that's starting to develop. Stars go through cycles of, you know, eventually burning out enough of that core that the thing will collapse and it can either start a new fire and grow again or it can actually just blow up and supernovas and a number of different things that can happen to them. This process of stars going through their life cycle of, of coming together and condensing and, and burning down and exploding creates all the different elements in our periodic table of elements. This is where all the known naturally occurring elements come from is through stars. Now when they explode and basically just spew this stuff out into space, then again gravity starts to take hold and work on all these particles that are out there, all these different elements, and they start to come together and sometimes what will happen is they start to come together to form another star, but there's still additional debris that's around the star, and as the star is coming together, it starts to turn, and this is one of the things that happens when it starts to get closer together, and so it creates a little bit of this gravitational spin that then these particles that are part of, are not particles, but these uh, the debris from other stars that have exploded that make up other types of elements start to come together to form things like planets and moons. So we've gone from basically just plasma to the initial types of atoms, the first ones, the hydrogen, to the formation of stars and whole galaxies of stars, and through star life cycles, creating even more elements that give birth to solar systems and planets. And planets themselves are not, for the most part, static. I mean, our planet itself is constantly moving. Now, sometimes not very fast, sometimes, you know, it's hard to tell. But like our continental drift is moving all the time, but about the speed that our fingernails grow. So we don't notice it. But there's this molten core that sometimes comes up. We've got you know volcanoes that'll happen. There's this recycling of the Earth's crust where it goes back underneath the other ones, melts, comes back up. I mean, the whole thing's moving and turning and doing things. We happen to be just far enough away from the sun that wasn't too far that we were able to, you know, have energy coming in the form of radiation from the sun, but not so much that it bombarded us, but we were also able to hold on to our water because of the mass of the planet. Uh, the, just a number of things that created an ideal environment for this ongoing evolutionary process to take us to that next step, which is the emergence of life. But before we talk about that, I just want to reflect on what we've seen, this amazing complexity that is just coming out of these basic rules of physics. A couple of different laws, gravity, electromagnetism, strong uh, nuclear force, and a handful of particles that led us from plasma to galaxies and solar systems and planets full of amazing activity. I mean, when we start to talk about biological evolution, we need to keep in mind it doesn't, when we think about evolution, it didn't start with just the biological part. There's this whole history of the universe that's demonstrating this ongoing growth and complexity uh, and this new emerging properties and just fascinating things happening. It's not something that is inconsistent with the rest of what's happening in the entire universe when we start to talk about the emergence and evolution of biological life. So I know that was a handful, but this is key. If we're going to try and understand who are we, where are we, what is this all about, we have to understand how these mechanisms are operating and why, you know, when we're talking about biological evolution, it is a natural outgrowth of what's already been happening up to this point with everything else at that chemical evolution level. So with that, we're going to talk about biological evolution, but it's going to have to be, for the sake of time, relatively brief. We may circle back around to this because one of the things that's very interesting about 
the emergence of life. This is this is probably the most controversial area when people want to talk about evolution. They might be comfortable with the idea that life forms change and evolve, but they're like, how did it initially come about? How how did life come out of non-life? It doesn't make any sense. And the reality is the conditions in which that was possible no longer exist, at least as far as we know, on our planet. And if it did, any new emerging kind of life is going to have to deal with a tremendous amount of competition from the life that's already here. So even if how life started happened multiple times or more than once in our history, um, it didn't have a chance compared to that initial formation when it was the only thing around. It, 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 it kind of took over, and, and we'll look at that here in just a minute. The other thing then that we want to talk about is what initially happens with the formation of the initial cells is a process that is still not completely understood. We've got a lot of theories that we're working on um, about you know what came first, the ability to have the energy to to metabolize that or, or, or you know create that cycle, or was it the replication part of it? Um, they're still debating a number of those things, but there's some fascinating studies being done, and they're making progress all the time. And and what's really you know clear about it is when you start to break down at the lower and lower levels of trying to understand what exactly is happening at the cellular level, what exactly is life versus non-life, there's really kind of this gray area where there's not really sure do we call this life or is it chemical you know I mean it's, there's a, a, a point where we say okay this is biological but there's really kind of a, a gray line sometimes between the chemical and the biological all right so when we have these early cells develop uh, they are able to replicate themselves and it starts with one that then this two and the two become four and the four become eight. And in a very short period of time, this process just grows exponentially. Um, in fact, whatever that initial cell was, we could look at in a certain sense as what they refer to as LUCA, the last common universal ancestor. Because Everything that is alive is descended from that. And I mean everything, whether you're talking about fungus or whether you're talking about plants or bacteria or mammals or reptiles, birds, everything is related. And this kind of, you know, early on when I started studying this stuff, that kind of blew my mind. I mean, I knew about biological evolution in terms of like how we understood, you know, the 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 tree of life as it related to different kinds of animals, but I didn't realize that it actually included plants. That just, it's just another indication of how incredible this is and how diversified things became. Uh, but you should know that the vast majority of life on earth currently and in our history has always been single-celled organisms. Uh, us, as these advanced multicellular organisms are really recent on the scene and only a handful of the diversity and the amount of different types of life that exist on our planet. But what we want to talk about now when we're talking about biological evolution is there's another kind of a process that comes into play here that's been dubbed natural selection by Darwin. And this is... It, to clarify it from what we might call intentional selection or artificial selection. So during Darwin's day, there was a lot of animal breeding that was going on, just like there has been for you know many thousands of years. Um, but what happens, it, it, he would notice, like with pigeons, they could create this vast diversity of how they looked. I mean, you could even custom order pigeons. So they would kind of talk like, uh, same thing was happening with dog breeds. I mean, just think today about, you know, the distinction between a Chihuahua and a St. Bernard and they're all descended from the gray wolf, right? That's like, wow, how did this happen? Well, there's intentional selection that's happening by breeders to bring about these certain traits. So natural selection is saying that it's basically that same principle, but instead of somebody intentionally trying to make a decision to bring something about, this is something that comes through natural 
processes. And essentially it's this. There's three main premises behind Darwin's theory of evolution that really are very um, simplistic in the sense that they're not simplistic, but simple, elegant, that it describes a phenomena that takes on tremendous impact on everything. And that is that within a population, you have um, ability for it to thrive, for it to grow, and it will keep growing until something in the environment basically kind of stops it, shuts it down um, uh, because either lack of resources or some other predator comes into play or who knows what, right? But there's, there's always a limitation that comes on the ability for it to just continue to expand and expand and expand. And so when that happens, through just random processes, either of replication errors or something happened with radiation from the sun, you know, impacting DNA at just the right time, right place, different types of mutations happen in the replication of that life. Sometimes they're disastrous, and sometimes they tend not to be advantageous. And when they are advantageous, in the sense of being able to continue to reproduce and or survive in their context, then it doesn't take long for their descendants to become more of the population. And so in a in a process of, you know, introducing a new design element, if you will, through that random mutation, then it, because of its ability, its successful ability over other ways of being that organism, will eventually take over that population. Um, and then the other key to that is that those mutations are heritable. And, of course, Darwin didn't understand about how that heritability works in terms of, you know, with the DNA like we do today. But it's how that process works. Because we can pass on those mutations, then that's how it can establish itself within the community because it gets replicated along with the regular replication. Uh, <clears throat> so you've got very small change that happens over long periods of time that equate to tremendous change. You can think about in a, a geological way something like the Grand Canyon. River running over stone, gradually breaking it down, pulling it away until you've got this tremendous beautiful canyon, uh, but it took a long time for this very gradual thing to produce this very beautiful um, location that we have today. Same kind of thing with life. Little tiny changes making big, big changes over long periods of time. But now they're able to like go back and understand when certain divisions happened. There's ways that they can measure when there was changes in the DNA about approximately when those things happened in terms of time. Um, I mean, this is the key thing that because we're all descended from cells and we're all using the same DNA pattern, we've got the same biochemical pathways for how we produce energy. We use our DNA has the same four letter code. Well, again, whether you're talking about plants, fungus, bacteria, humans, other animals, whatever, all using the same thing. Um, it allows for a great deal of, of technology to be able to map this stuff out and understand where things are related and how they're related and when they diverged. Um, and, and all of this is without any kind of fossil evidence necessary. I mean, people talk about the fossil evidence, but that's kind of a, a tricky thing because it's hard to generate fossils. They don't happen except under very unique circumstances. So the fact that we do have fossil evidence that does support what we understand about evolution is another confirmation, but we actually have confirmation from far more areas of study than the fossil record, whether we're talking about the, the genetic side of things or we're talking about embryology or we're talking about some aspects of morphology. You know, the fact that, you know, the design of the hand is basically in all sorts of things that don't need them, like wings or flippers, um, or the idea that there's vestigial things where we have remnants of things that we used to need but we don't need anymore. I mean, we talk about with humans this idea of about like the appendix, but there's things where, if I remember this correctly, I think whales actually have hip bones that are, you know, carryovers from the time when they used to be land animals and had four legs. Um, you know, things like that where it's obviously not designed because it needed a hip, it's just still there because at one point it had a need for hip bones. The other thing then is we can still see it happening today. 
you know, when we talk about super bugs where we're telling people, you know, use the antibiotics the way they're prescribed. Don't shorten it. Don't, you know, medicate yourself. Follow the plan specifically because what happens is, you know, when you're trying to treat this bacterial infection with these antibiotics, um, if you don't wipe it out completely, and by going through the full regimen, which is going to last sometimes past the time that you feel symptoms, you allow a possibility for the, the bug to get an upper hand to adapt to the antibiotic. We're talking about like real-time evolution because you're talking about things that have very short life cycles. And so the shorter the life cycle, the faster it's possible for evolution to happen. And the fact that we've got antibiotic resistant bugs in our world today is a very real and um, in your face example of ongoing evolution happening today. And there's a lot of other things we could look at. But again, this process of, you know, we saw from the very beginning about this increasing complexity that's happening through these natural laws where it's not requiring anything other than these basic elements to happen and moving into this biological side of things where this simple process of natural selection where certain organisms are better suited to survive uh, and to reproduce that then because of heritability allow the offspring of that population to continue to evolve or if they get separated to evolve in different ways which has also happened. So this is biological evolution. The, the next thing that he talks about is the social sciences coming on board. And here we're talking about this idea of like cultural evolution. And here we bring in again this idea of meme. So when we're talking about heritability in the biological stuff, we're talking about genes. In the cultural evolution, what gets kind of inherited is memes. And again, these are ideas, concepts, stories that help us to understand things in different ways that transform the way we do things. So if we think about how does cultural evolution happen? Well, we went from, and we talked about this in a lot more detail in the episode where we talked about a new story. I think that's episode four, so you might want to go back to that one if you want to dive into this whole thing. But we moved from hunter-gatherers into tribe situations, and part of what was happening with these transformations of moving from different size groupings required us to have new ways to think about people we didn't know. So initially we're kind of restricted and socially to groups where we're able to know each other. Um, to move into these larger configurations of social gathering, we needed a, a mental apparatus, an idea, a story, a way of viewing the world that allowed us to incorporate essentially strangers and how do we operate with those. And this is what's happening then with those memes and go back and watch that episode on stories and how that functions because it's really key to a lot of how we understand things. But we go then from hunter-gatherer to tribes and then tribes we go to this idea of chiefdoms and from chiefdoms we go to kingdoms and from kingdoms we start to evolve into different political ways of thinking about things where we have more of what we think of modern nation states and where is that going to go? It's continuing to change. We're continuing to evolve our, our political thinking, our way of organizing ourselves and thinking about who we are as a people, um, how we're connected and related. Um, the fact that our, our whole system from like an ecological perspective is all connected is really transforming these earlier ways of thinking where it was much more tribal in the sense of, you know, we've got our own little thing and they've got their own little thing and we can do whatever we want, they can do what they want. Well, now we realize it's all connected. We can't think like we used to. So it's continuing to change, continuing to evolve. So we're looking at evolution then, again, very introductory, but we can see this grand sweep where we're going from <laughs> plasma to particles to atoms to stars, which then solar systems, uh, galaxies, and um, planets that are, you know, got the right stuff on them, this ongoing chemical evolution into what we call biological life and how that continues to evolve into more and more complex uh, forms of life until you get to people where you actually then have cultures and those cultures then continue to evolve. It's, it's not just 
one aspect that impacts science. It's, it's tackling everything, and you really you can't understand anything about what's going on from a science perspective, who we are as people, where we came from, how our minds function, unless you understand how this process works. So understanding what we are is vital for learning how we can affect change to bring about greater well-being for ourselves and for our world. I appreciate this was a, a very brief introduction, so I... Uh, Hope that you'll have some patience, that there's probably a lot of unanswered questions. We'll come back around to some of these things as we tackle more specifics to get at more of, you know, how these building blocks of reality work, how reality is structured, how we use stories to understand and interpret reality, and how we can tap into that to bring about transformation in ourselves in ways that, again, bring greater peace, well-being, happiness, mission, purpose, direction, all those things that are so vital for us to feel like we're really thriving. So thank you for joining me today, and we will be back again next week. Be well. 